are really, really excited to have the IMSA Battle on the Bricks in September 2023. And in 2024 and 2025, we got a little bit of a twist. We're going we're gonna to make it a, a special sports car race. But next year, we'll, alongside NBC, we'll be live in a two-hour and 40-minute race here at the Speedway. But I'm so excited to do this. Thanks Thank you us. so much for, <laughs> uh, for being here with us today. Makes two of us, for sure. This is a great day for IMSA, um, both for our partners who've been begging to come to this market. It's a great market for activation, so we plan to fill the midway with uh, hopefully all 18 auto manufacturer displays. Uh, our race teams, our manufacturers uh, want to compete here. We have 18 manufacturers in IMSA competition. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to bring the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship uh, to the Sunday of that weekend, the 17th, live on NBC, um, uh, network television, so we're thrilled with that. Also, our Michelin Pilot Challenge. Uh, we're going to, as Doug said, put a twist on it. They're going to run a four-hour endurance race here on Saturday of that weekend, the 16th, uh, daylight into darkness. Uh, in preparation for what we're going to do uh, in the next two years of 24 and 25, and run a long distance IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship race. Hi everybody and welcome back to Full Throttle Powered by Race for RP. For our news segment, that's obviously the leadoff. Huge news coming out of Indianapolis as John Doonan, President and CEO of IMSA, making that huge announcement. And to our good fortune, our news specialist, our analyst extraordinaire, Cal Fish, happened to be at that very announcement. And Cal, not only was it big news, I think it was great news. It really is going to be so cool to see the sports cars back at the Brickyard, as they said. Battle on the bricks is going to be a big weekend. Greg Michel and Pilot are going to be there on the Saturday, running into the nighttime hours, so that'll be cool. And one thing that both John Doonan and the IMSA, uh, the IMSA president and the IMS president, Doug Bowles, really stressed, we want to really bring the flavor of sports cars here to Indianapolis. So the, the infield is going to have all of the camping grounds opened up there. They're not going to be on the tee box, or maybe the golf course, but they're certainly going to be filling that infield much like Sebring and really get that flavor so be great to see them back and the big news is that in the subsequent years in 2024 2025 that event is not only going to be the traditional two hour 40 minute race but an extension of that they haven't determined what that length will be but will now then become one of the Michelin Endurance Cup rounds as well so very very exciting news. That's great news, and I believe that's the first time that they've ever, IMS has ever allowed camping on the infield, uh, overnight camping. So I think that's a pretty big statement about how serious they are about this event. Well, Roger loves sports cars, right? He loves Roger Penske. Bringing sports cars back to the speedway in a big way has uh, really been very much on the top of his list of priorities since he's taken over the speedway. And uh, you go there, Greg. I know you've been there many times. I was there last year. But even returning this year for this weekend's doubleheader there with IndyCar and NASCAR, you walk through different areas of the facility, and it is just top-notch. It is first class, and just the history there. Everyone wants to win at the Speedway, certainly the Indy 500, the Brickyard 400, and the big traditional races. But to be a sports car winner there as well has tremendous value to someone's resume. Well, and we can't deny the obvious Penske connection with Penske Porsche coming in with the new GTP program next year, running both overseas in the World Endurance Championship. But in IMSA, naming it the, the GTP category, uh, that's an obvious connection. But then you look at the fact that although it won't be the headlining, uh, WeatherTech series, uh, IMSA having an appearance at the new Chicago track that's uh, that's been announced. Uh, obviously, Roger wants uh, the the IMSA series running at the Speedway, but IMSA is clearly going after some bigger markets. But yeah, I mean, John Doonan has stressed this. We have 18 manufacturers involved across all of the IMSA platforms there, and they want to be in Indianapolis. That's why we're there. And to have the opportunity, there's been a lot of dialogue over the last couple of three years, and now it's finally been announced. Obviously, you got to shuffle the, the schedule a little bit to allow for that to happen, but that's been created. We'll get the full announcement this week at Road America about what they're going to do with the full calendar of events. But it's a wonderful opportunity, first-class plays, and I think multi-class racing is going to really fit in there. you got the wide expanses of the straightaway there. There's the twisty stuff, and I agree with you, Greg, in terms of our conversations in the past. You need that flavor. You need that little curveball with the traffic and the different classes running together. And through the twisty stuff, it's going to give that ample opportunity to exist. Yeah, I think it's going to be fascinating to see that, uh, that multi-class racing. And obviously, 
last time that IMSA was there was 2014, and uh, the racing was pretty darn good. And I think with the timing of this happening in 2023, with GTP becoming the uh, headliner with that new hybrid uh, category, uh, this is this is really some big news for a, a vastly improving and continuously growing IMSA. Well, the cars are just phenomenal. I mean, we've seen the pictures. We've seen some of the video now of all of these uh, LMDH cars testing from BMW, Car Cadillac, Porsche, Acura. <laughs> And then you've got some really new sexy GT3 machinery that's just been announced too from Porsche and Ferrari. So the grid is going to look fantastic. And to hear that noise going down that straightaway and echoing off the grandstands is going to be a great feel. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Uh, looking forward to that very, very much. Now, uh, let's change it up just a little bit. Uh, we, we have to get back and talk a little bit about Formula One because... Once again, seems like one of the big pieces of news that comes out of most every Formula One weekend lately is uh, Ferrari making some strategy blunder and perhaps taking them out of an opportunity for a win. Well, I think the thing is they're under tremendous pressure. I mean, they've had the fastest car really since the beginning of the year, but they're not executing, Greg. They threw one away once again this weekend. I mean, they really felt the pressure of Max Verstappen kind of doing the undercut. And what they did was, Greg, they pitted at a point in the race with 40 laps to go. They'd already gone medium, medium. With the Formula One regulations, you have to run a different compound. But with 40 laps to go, you had to go with the hard. The softs weren't going to make it. So they forced their hand by pitting. What they should have done is just stayed out there. Forget what Red Bull were doing. They overreacted to the timing of it. And as he's coming in pit lane, they only had one choice, and that was to go hard. So the hards were not working on that circuit, particularly on race day where the conditions were much cooler. The track didn't have any temperature. We saw drivers sliding all over the road on the reconnaissance lap when they were trying those hard tires, coming back to the grid and saying, no way can we use those today if you're thinking about that as a strategy call. And Ferrari once again, again got it wrong it's hard to believe the speed they have in that car and at this point in the season Greg that Lewis Hamilton has more podium finishes right now than Charles Leclerc I don't really understand uh, I, I thought I made it clear enough on the radio that the medium was a good tire and uh, unfortunately we decided to stop on those hard which I don't exactly know what was the goal there but uh, yeah I guess we need to accept it now I mean we need to get better, for sure, and uh, I, don't, I don't really know what to say, to be honest. They need to regroup. I mean, they have the pace in that race car. They've got to start executing, but now that we look at Max Verstappen with an 80-point lead in the Drivers' Championship, that's going to be tough to make up over three Grand Prix in terms of uh, points total there. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that if, if Leclerc wins every race, gets the points for pole, fast lap, and uh, any any other points that are there, and Max finishes second at every round, championship would still be Max's. I mean, they are really, really behind the eight ball now. And the interesting thing to me, in a, in a post-race uh, interview, and it was very quickly after the race, but in that interview, uh, it was really interesting that, that Bonato just kind of brushed it off. Certainly, we didn't have today the performance we were expecting. I've seen whatever we were. The, the, the tires we're using, soft, medium, or hard, I think at the end, the performance of our car, of, of our car was not as expected. And uh, when the car is not performing well, whatever, because of maybe the weather conditions, it was a lot cooler today compared to the Friday. Then it's difficult somehow to try to have the right speed, the right pace, and keep up the, 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 somehow on the, with the position on track. So uh, today the car was not behaving well. I think that's the point. That's the first time this season. So in 12 races, the first time that, uh, or 13 or 12, race is the first time is not working as we are hoping for we try to understand the reason of well i mean you don't like to wash dirty laundry in public i mean charles leclerc has been very good at that i remember one race i think i'm at monaco where he got up and kind of got the finger pointing to him like make sure you say the right thing here kind of michael schumacher-esque in terms of to the public to the media we're doing what we need to do behind closed doors. You can have it out with the team and really start to point some fingers and uh, say we need to clean this up. But he's done a great job. Um, uh, Matteo just, uh, uh, he, you know, it's right there and then. That's in the moment. They don't have the data there. I'm not sure who on that pit wall is making that call. I don't think it's Bernardo. Do you know what I mean? So he needs to do a, kind of do a full debrief with the whole team there and understand how did we do this once again? Yeah, they definitely have some work to do. Another piece of Formula One news that I wanted to on here that on one level, 
will look somewhat innocuous, which is the announcement that Honda has decided to extend their deal with Red Bull through 2025 and complete the current engine spec. Um, and then Red Bull and Red Bull powertrains will pick up in, in uh, 2026 with we, the general consensus is it'll be with, uh, with Porsche. And that would seem, okay, is that really that big a news? But one, it gives some consistency and allows the Milton Keynes outfit to be able to focus on those 2026 engine regs with Porsche. But importantly, Cal, it might just give them a little bit of extra concessions. It does, because I believe the rules are when you have a new manufacturer coming in, they have more what they call tokens, which is kind of uh, free reign to do some upgrades and so learn as you go, do some upgrades within the season, which some of the other manufacturers are not allowed to do. So from Red Bull's perspective and Christian Horner, they've got their game right. I mean, they tick all of the boxes. They're looking ahead. They understood that Honda were going to pull out, ironically, on the back of the World Championship that Max achieved last year. So now they're continuing to use the architecture of that Honda motor moving forward through to 2025 alongside Red Bull Technologies and they're building up their engine department so when Porsche climb on board here for 2026 they have so many of the pieces in place and they'll do very well. And they'll be very possibly considered a new manufacturer entrant and thus all of those a little extra concessions so they play their cards really really well and then when you compare and contrast that with Ferrari it can be on, a, on occasion pretty stark but no questioning Ferrari, uh, Ferrari's pace they just need to start to get it right. Cal, as always, thank you so much for joining us, giving us your insights. We look forward to hearing from you again. Appreciate it, mate. All the best. All right, everybody. We have a lot more yet to come here on Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. The 2020 IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge season went really well for us. Um, you know, we helped drive some awareness and accelerated some research for Race for RP. You know, it's so powerful and moving and helped so many people that need it. Being one of the ambassadors for the brand is, is hugely important for me. We had a good year. We were defending champions, coming back to try and to recap that same championship again. Uh, we had a great start. We were fighting all the way until the end uh, for the championship. We ended up taking second overall, which I can't really be too upset about, but at the end of the day, I'm a competitor and, and I love fighting. So the top prize would have been sweet. Um, fellow Race for RP ambassadors ended up winning the championship. So Race for RP was 1-2. Uh, eyes looking forward to 21 and hoping that we can continue pushing harder and, and generating more awareness and research for everybody and more success for racing. Welcome back to Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. And obviously, one of our huge goals with this program is to help raise awareness and education and be able to maybe help fund some research for the cure to Race for RP and relapsing polychondritis. And that means every once in a while, we're going to talk with some of the researchers and doctors that are deeply involved in that program. And recently at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, I had the chance to sit down with Rashmi Kanagal Shamana, and she is a cancer researcher that works for the MD Anderson Cancer Center, but she is working with some of the researchers that are working on autoimmune disease and on relapsing polychondritis and taking that research in a very different outside of the box direction. The story is so fascinating. Uh, you know, you work uh, in the MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas. It's a cancer research facility and program, and yet we're hearing that you're doing some cutting edge work on autoimmune diseases and relapsing polychondritis uh, will certainly be a benefactor of that. Um, how did that connection develop? Right, so that's a great question. Uh, so we are now aware that relapsing polychondritis and other autoimmune disorder uh, uh, patients that are affected by these disorders have abnormalities in the bone marrow. So when uh, I'm a hematopathologist, so I look at the cells under a microscope, and when I see that, I see 
uh, morphologically, but I can visually see these abnormalities. And uh, so these patients, you know, eventually about 20% of them go on to develop blood cancers or bone marrow, which arise from the bone marrow. So essentially bone marrow cancers. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from my end, from the cancer end, the diseases of bone marrow, especially the one I'm studying, that's myelodysplastic syndrome, about a quarter of these cases have abnormalities. It have an immune inflammatory background. And it is still, there's a lot of effort that's put into it, but we are still unclear how this inflammation leads to abnormalities of the bone marrow, right? So I think that's where we see the connection. Uh, with the recent discovery that Dr. Beck has shown that the UBA1 mutations in a specific subtype of RP, the Vexa syndrome, has connected this link, showing that both these may be two ends of the same spectrum of um, autoimmune disorder leading up to clonal hematopoiesis mm -hmm. that leads on to uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. And I think it would, I think this, this is uh, fascinating because it's providing us the window of opportunity where if we are able to identify what is this connection, number one, in addition to identifying the root cause for some of the RP patients, we are able to kind of uh, prevent these patients from developing bone marrow, future bone marrow diseases, right? I mean, we can improve the quality of life. We can prevent them from developing anemia, which is what tires them, and prevent them from uh, getting cancer. So you're saying there's a link between you get inflammation, cartilage inflammation that can then get into the bone marrow, and that can then evolve or, or, or mutate yes. into this form of cancer. Yes. And so you take it and you backtrack it, you go from the cancer end back through to find out the root causes, and that can help autoimmune sufferers. And, and to support wow. that, it's, it's amazing that, I mean, all this, the UBA1 essentially, it's not even been two years since we know about it. It's fascinating that the cancer community has accepted this to be within the spectrum of bone marrow diseases. So essentially, I think it was just two weeks back, we had two standardized classification schemes that come out every few years or so, the WHO classification and the international consensus classification. Both the classifications have independently incorporated vexes in uh, diseases of bone marrow. And that's, that shows how much impact this uh, specific uh, research question would have for community uh, of patients with both autoimmune disorders as well as cancer. And so Vexus, real quick, for those that are familiar with it, that is a form of autoimmune disorder, yes, essentially? It, it, is, it is an adult onset uh, multisystem autoimmune inflammatory disorder, but the specific thing uh, uh, is the presence of UBA1 mutations. And typically, these patients also have abnormalities, w what we see are vacuoles within the myeloid and you know, the white blood cells and the red blood cells. So the vacuoles are also typical, but not in all. So is that is that UBA1, is that what you would call a biomarker? Is that? Yes, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a diagnostic marker, biomarker, exactly. One of the challenges I know for treating RP and other autoimmune diseases is, you know, I mean, one, you have a lot of patients that don't even know they have it. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get samples um, is a huge thing. And I know that there's been some big steps recently in terms of biobanks. Uh, that's so crucial for research, isn't it? Because that's where you get the, the actual physical material that you exactly. can start to test, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Okay. And that's where I think the uh, role of MD Anderson comes in. Uh, we've been, um, not necessarily for Rexis, for any blood cancers, we've been proactively banking all of the specimens, I, I believe, for the last 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And now we, all we need to do is screen for UBA1 mutations and go back to those cells and analyze them further. And, and we know a significant proportion of them also have cancer. So that's, that's the gold mine right there. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, I, I believe you first got trained as an MD, as a doctor. Then you obviously went the research route. What drew you to that? You know, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I think working at MD and Anderson, it's, it's a cancer center, the biggest cancer center, and the, uh, they foster research, creativity, innovation, and, and, and collaboration, and, and uh, 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 the support that we have 
the encouragement that we have for research is amazing. And I've been lucky because I think with the RP Foundation, who is, whose objective is kind of aligned to exactly what I'm interested in and uh, their support for research, and they were the first one, they, they kind of saw the value of this link between autoimmune and the uh, blood cancers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, I think, uh, pivotal in bringing me and da Dr. David back together, connecting us so we can kind of brainstorm and, and work it through. Uh, and, and I think uh, be work me at MD Anderson and with David Beck at New York, it, it's just, going to be a great collaboration and we've been working at, at this for the for a few months now and and um, I can honestly say I, he's one of the you know smartest brilliant scientists and and I look forward to discussions every week when we have our scheduled meetings well you know they say two minds are greater than one and I would think two great minds are way better than <laughs> than other uh, than one mind so um, that's fascinating to me in going through some of your of your history, you've won numerous awards. You've been published many, many times over. Obviously, there's been lots of things that have happened for you. What's you know one of the most exciting things that, as you've been going through your research, whether it's RP or otherwise, uh, that you've just had an aha moment that has just really you know, startled you and 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 got you on a new path, for instance. Yeah. yeah so. So every, every, so I have like close to 200 publications now, and I started it all as a trainee at MD Anderson, and the very first paper, <clears throat> when it got accepted, it is not a great paper, it's just a small series of patients with a very rare disorder. Uh, that's uh, th my first year as a fellow. A few years later, I collected more, performed multi-institutional studies and built on it, and two weeks ago, the international consensus has recognized that as a provisional entity and and I cannot believe it it started out with one case yeah. uh, of bone marrow from a patient that I saw and in the last 10 years how it's evolved and and I think of uh, vexus RP they're all rare disorders but doesn't mean we should we dismiss them because uh, they will probably provide us the clue to the much broader uh, pathways that, that might be implicated in many more diseases. And I love the reverse engineering you know, you know, part of it. When you see that connection, you go, well, let's start here and go backwards mm -hmm. and find maybe that'll give us those, uh, those, uh, those critical things. Obviously, you've been dealing with the RP Foundation, but this seems, I think, might be your first experience at a racetrack with Race for RP, which is a, a wonderfully novel approach to use the passion of motorsports that fans have, that competitors have, uh, to try and raise awareness and education and ultimately funding mm -hmm. for what you do. Mm -hmm. um, I believe a guy named Didier Tays gave you uh, a couple of laps this morning around oh, the yeah. Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Oh yeah. How was that? Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a lifetime experience. So this is my first time. Yeah. And I got to do a hot lap with him, so that it, it was it was fantastic. I was a bit jittery at first. Uh, the track was a bit damp, but then he took me around, and and before I knew it, I I asked him, "Are we done? Can we go for another one?" So <laughs> it's it's been an awesome experience. Good. So so the one thing I saw something that was um, that I learned is how how much passion the drivers have at this race, the fans, and, and the, uh, the physics that go behind, the mechanics that go behind, the engineering, the um, efforts of so many people that are behind each driver, and the level of commitment. Uh, I, I kind of see the same, um, that's, you know, it's similar to what we do in research. Sure. Everything is teamwork, and it, I give my expertise as a hematopathologist and a molecular pathologist, David brings in his genetic uh, expertise and, and that's how it works. Uh, uh, I, I think we are on the right path and uh, I think, I believe we're gonna make strides. Well, and I think, you know, Race for RP, that program obviously uh, helps create the opportunity to have the funding and, and, and uh, everything necessary for you. And that's one of the things that I love about the Race for RP deal, because obviously what you do is science, 
and racing is science, physics. It's a different branch, yes, yes. but science is science. Yes. And I think having that blending um, is, is really insightful and I think can be incredibly productive. And, and uh, it, it, it leaves, I think, people with a lot of optimism about um, where this can you know, go and how we can help people that are suffering from you know, multiple different types of disorders. Obviously, you know, relapsing polychondritis. I one couldn't of them. agree more. Uh, so even in in the medical field, that just starts out with biological sciences, but we are doing all sophisticated sequencing now for this project too. <coughs> so that brings in uh, molecular biology and uh, bioinformatics to an analyze those mutations, and then in pathology that uh, I'm doing, uh, AI is is now the in thing. Yeah. It's uh, the physics, uh, it, it's all merge, it's, it's all science. Everything, yeah. it's, it's the same thing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it is, it is absolutely fascinating. The work you're doing is, is extraordinary on so many levels, and uh, I think it's an absolute treat for us to have you here this weekend, let you see what happens at the racetrack, have the race for RP experience, get a ride with one of the greatest sports car drivers ever, in my opinion, and uh, the smile on your face tells me that you are enjoying it. Yes, I am. I also want to, again, uh, once again, I couldn't have even had the opportunity to pursue this uh, without the support from uh, RP Foundation, the patients, the patient advocates, and uh, my institution to provide the resources and, and uh, collaboration with David. Yep, an opportunity to truly do some good in the world. Thank you so much, Rashmi, for taking the time to Thank come and join you. us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Greg. All right. It's with thinking like that that we are going to start to see some fabulous strides made in finding a treatment and even a cure for autoimmune diseases like relapsing polychondritis. So a huge thank you to Rashmi for taking a nice chunk of time in helping to explain that. And of course, we have much more coming at you here in Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. This is Neil Langberg. The old guy racer, number 153, 488 Evo car. And I was thinking about racing here at Sonoma Raceway. Racing is a pursuit with no real finish line. It's a sport that tests your courage, your physical strength, and your mental capacity every single lap. So if you have the stamina to pursue it, the most important step is securing a top level team and instructors. And it's likewise for a person with an autoimmune disease like relapsing polychondritis. You not only need good quality medical care, but you need a team of professionals to help drive awareness and accelerate research. And that's what the Race for RP is all about and the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation. We're here to raise awareness, educate people about autoimmune diseases, and boost the resources available to further research into autoimmune disease. We hope this helps. Stay focused, keep your eyes up, and we'll talk to you again later. Thanks very much. Welcome back to Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. Time for our segment, Rising Star, presented by Porsche. And one of the things that tells you that you are considered a rising star in the Porsche pyramid is when you get asked to do an onboard lap for one of the TV shows covering the Porsche Carrera Cup North America. And recently at Long Beach, California, Parker Thompson was asked to do just that, and it's worth a look. We're coming down the front straightaway here at Long Beach, about the highest top speed we face this season. One of the biggest brake zones as well. Aim for the 400 board, maximize the brake zone with a lot of roll speed. Don't hit the exit wall and let's get set up for the fountain. You go through the fountain, you definitely want to get on the curb as much as you can. First gear, come up through second, buzz it off the limiter, turn in for turn four, let the car get out to the wall, use everything for turn five, clip the turn five curb, catch it, get on throttle. Now we're headed down to turn six. Another big brake zone, get on the brakes about the 275, get down to apex, watch out for the oil dry, and get on the throttle as fast as we can. Up over through to turn eight, all about the exit. You've gotta get the exit. Apex at where the crosswalk meets the wall, and down into turn nine. 
down the back straight. All I'm focused on here is hitting my mark, getting to that 350 board, big brake, roll speed, get it to second. You're on the drift rubber, there's a ton of grip. Roll as much speed as you can through turn 10, and then the most important turn on the track, turn 11, buzz it into first, right hand down, get on the throttle, and then bring it home. Make sure you extend every shift. As soon as you hit the limiter here, it's worth a good chunk of time. That is a lap around the Grand Prix of Long Beach.
Well, he is unquestionably one of the stars on the rise in the Porsche Pyramid. We'll be hearing a lot more from him as the years go by. And you'll be hearing a lot more from us here on Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP, when we come back. The Pet RP Center is a comprehensive program for patients who have relapsing polychondritis. I think it's hard when patients come into a center and they say they have RP and people kind of scratch their head and they have no idea what it is. But when people come here, they see providers who know the disease, we're familiar with it, we know how it impacts patients, we know what the disease manifestations are. You know, we don't know everything, we don't have standard of care treatments for these patients. And so the research that we're doing is helping us to learn more about the disease and then develop effective therapies. Research is expensive. I think people don't always recognize that. There is a lot that goes into building the infrastructure for research. There's coordinator time, there's provider time, all the um, equipment that we need to collect blood and to analyze data. It's just unfortunately not possible without the dollars that go to support that. They want their lives back and they're not able to to do things that they would normally be able to do, spend time with their families, chase after their kids. It's a major life change for them, and, and that's really hard. Our goal is to try to give them their life back so that they can do all the things that they want to do, so that this is something where, you know, their disease does not define them, but it, it, it's a part of their life, but it, it doesn't define what they can do and what they can't do. Great to have you back with us here on Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. We've got a treat for you. A little bit earlier, we did a long interview with Bill Oberlin and got into a number of topics. And one of the most fascinating was, how did this all get started for a guy who has become a living and still racing legend? Well, with Bill, as it turns out, it's the same as it does for so many drivers when they're trying to get into the sport. It comes from humble family beginnings. I couldn't do it because we didn't have really sponsors, so I couldn't pay to go racing, so I had to do it all myself. So my dad and I, luckily he had the Porsche before, and he raced the 911 RSR that they built. Uh, we sold that car. It's a, kind of a longish story. My dad said, hey, look, I can't afford racing anymore. You can do it any which way you, you want, but I know at the end of the day, that car was his. And the Porsches weren't uh, competitive anymore. so. Uh, his car had history. My dad won Sebring in 1985, if you can imagine that, which was a big race. I took the car and I sold it right away because it had history, made a lot of money, and I bought a Mazda RX-7. And I bought it from a, a guy named Roger Mandeville in Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Coincidentally, that's where BMW factory is as well. And I drove the truck to uh, South Carolina, picked up the car with the spare engine, brought it home, and we put it on the floor. And this is when this team consisted of myself and two Porsche mechanics. We were all Porsche mechanics for a Porsche repair shop. And we unloaded the car, we unloaded the engine, and I said, Who, how are we gonna rebuild this engine? Like, it's a rotary. We had no concept, right, of how to do this. We were gonna figure out the gearbox, and this is, we do everything in-house. This was a couple of kids, we're all in our 20s. And um, I called Mazda, Damon Barnett, who was head of Mazda at the time, and I said, hi, I'm Bill Arbelin, uh, I'm trying to be a race car driver. Do you guys have a class on rotary engines? And he goes, he, he laughs on the phone. He goes, no, we don't, have a, we don't have a class on rotary engines. I said, well, I, I got to do it myself. And I tell him the story. And, um, and so he says, let me call you back in a little bit. He calls me back and he says, um, how's Tuesday, Wednesday of next week? And I said, great. Why? What's going on? I'll send Fuji, our top engine builder from Japan. He'll give you a two-day class. Great. That sounds fantastic. His plane lands from Tokyo. He gets off the plane. I'm holding a sign, Fuji. The guy says, hello. He speaks zero English. I speak zero <laughs> Japanese. And, but measurements are measurements, and he showed me the way. And my first engine was very, it was very simple, very easy to do, 352 horsepower. And this little group of guys and myself stayed in one hotel room. We drove the crummy truck across the country. We would do anything for fundraising to, uh, to try to raise just enough money to go racing. We had Yokohama as a sponsor that would donate tires. And eventually, we became very good. And we started winning races and, and uh, up and up and up and winning quite a few races. Then we became something, that race in New Orleans, going for the championship against 
Jorge Treos in a Porsche. BMWs yeah. were there and we were competing against them. And when I totaled out my poor Mazda, I couldn't believe it, right through the chicane, Charlie Slater, who was the owner of IMSA at the time, said, hey, I got a Porsche and uh, why don't you try it? And I got in it and I was in qualifying with this thing and I wound up getting the pole, I won the race. And I mean, yeah, Eric is very nice. I feel like I was twisting their arm after that to get the deal. <laughs> I showed up in Texas World Speedway and this is a true story. Uh, they hired me, well, Tom Milner called eventually and we spoke and he said, can you do Texas World Speedway? And I said, yes. And he says, how much uh, will it cost? And I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. you can make money in car racing. I had no idea ever I was gonna make money in car racing. I thought it was for the love of the sport. When you do something you love, you never work a day in your life. And this is all yeah. I want to do for the rest of my life, right? We work out a price. I go to Texas World Speedway. This is gonna be the highlight of my career by miles. There's the first union truck. There comes the first union car out. I look for my name on it. Nope, it's not on that one. Well, it must be on the Valvoline car. Valvoline car comes out. Nope, it's not on that one. I'm like, huh, but I don't know anybody there. So I feel like a little fish out of water. And a fifth wheel truck pulls up and a brand new white BMW pulls out. It says Matt Cohen, Bill Arnold. Well, uh, it was a customer car that they had built for this kid. And I'm like, okay, well, they're putting me in that car. Let's just see how it goes. And we go out there and I fall in love with the BMW immediately. I'm like, this is the best handling car. And I understood everything, the DNA of a BMW, I understood it very well. Um, but we were extremely slow in a straight line compared to the factory cars. And I asked this Matt Cohen kid, I go, I go, hey, he was a very wealthy young kid from New York, very nice kid. I said, what's with this motor? And he goes, well, we have a three liter, the factory cars have a 3.2. And I don't know if they really know this story. I go, what happens uh, if that motor blows up? He goes, I guess they have to give me one of theirs. I go, you gotta blow this thing up. You gotta get rid of this thing. And he goes, how do you do it? It was when we had the Hewland H pattern. So it was a six speed straight cut gearbox. I go, stick it in the wrong gear a few times, it's gonna come apart, I guarantee you. And he, he could do it anywhere. This is Texas World Speedway, it's a giant racetrack. He right. comes down the front straight, straight in front of me, jams it into every wrong gear. The, the pitch went so high, dogs 20 miles away were screaming, and then finally parts fall out. They, um, they put the 3.2 liter motor in just as we thought, off to the races we go. Next practice session, I was the quickest, everything was good, I go to qualify, this is when BMWs had a little differential problem back in the day. The diff blows up, I don't, so we don't qualify. I start dead last. I'm now leading the race after 10, 15 minutes and I'm running away and I'm thinking, this is beautiful. And this was the day and age that if you had a lead driver who at the time was Pete Halsmer, um, he would pick which car was doing the best. That's the car he would jump into to finish to get the most points. Well, I think, okay, when I come in, Matt Cohen's gonna jump in. We're gonna struggle a little bit and that'll be the end, but I had a good time. I come into the pits, nobody said a word. As I'm getting out of the car, Pete Halsmer is getting in, and I'm like, wow, they're going for the win with this thing, with me driving, this is gonna be incredible. Pete Halsmer goes, and um, and he makes it to about 10 or 15 minutes from the end leading the race, the differential blows up again, and we don't win. But they, I think David Donnie, who was heading off to that North American Touring Car Series, I think, conveniently, right. I took his spot, and 27 years later, I'm still driving free BMW, I, I went to the next race in like Sears Point. I think we finished one, two, three, and then we won a lot after that. A lot of champ. I think I'm quite a few championships into it now and wins. And yes, this was a relationship that was meant to be. And I'm, I am, I count my blessings every day that that happened the way it did. Oh yeah, I mean you've you've done the blue the blue propeller proud. That's for sure. Um, you know, one quick thing on on the uh, the Mazda thing back in that era. You know, the races that I announced and and we got to talking. You were making parts last two, three, four races longer than the the factory teams. When you stepped into that BMW program where they it was top tier, uh, that had to be just you know amazing to know that, all right, I can just push this stuff and it might not break other than those diffs back in that era, uh, but so I might have a real shot at some stuff. You're 100% right. In that Mazda, in the day and age, uh, I was actually buying parts old parts from Clayton Cunningham and Roger Mandeville to try to make go further. And we weren't, in the beginning, we couldn't make them go, it would blow up because they knew when to time them out. But when you get to a factory team with a factory program and you see new parts going on, new ECUs, new suspension parts, and you're like, wow, this is a whole different level of budget. You can, like you said, you can push to the end and you, once they got their sea legs under them, we were, we were very hard to beat. Yeah, no kidding. And to date, 
And let's take a look here. We've got a picture of you early on in your career, um, enjoying the laurels on the top of the box, as they say, uh, up there celebrating just a little bit from a while back. Uh, but if I have my stats right, your current count of standing on the top of the podium, having driven a BMW to victory, stands at something like, what, 516? Uh, it's a lot. I actually don't know, but it's a lot now if you think yeah. about the podium. Do you, do you know those people who are in that picture? That's so funny. <laughs> the guy on the right is Joe Vardy. Yeah, I'm absolutely. It is. I mean, this is Him and I had the craziest battle. I was so slow on a straight line in my, in my Mazda. He was so fast in straight line, but I handled so good. We passed every single lap for hours. It was the craziest thing. Was, that was a good race. And on the other side, I think that's Andy Pilgrim, isn't it? Yeah, that looks like Andy Pilgrim, and I forgot the guy yeah. next to him. Uh, yeah. Oh, and then that's yeah. the uh, – is that Jorge Treos or or one of those guys anyways? But, yeah, well, that was a good group. Yep, a lot of time standing up there on the top of the box getting the trophies. Now, you know, a lot of people might not be aware that you did do a little bit of open wheel racing. Um, you did a little time in, in, in Formula Atlantics. What was the reason that you decided to give that a go? Um, Yokohama was a sponsor there and they gave me an opportunity to try it out. And, and I also had a, a few sponsors at the time that wanted to do something like that. And they were thinking about maybe going Indy car racing. So that's kind of where we went. And we did a few races and we were doing reasonably well. Like my, I think my first race was in Miami. I finished second there right out of the, behind Patrick Carpentier. And, um, and I thought this could be good. Then as the career kind of went on, I had an opportunity to go IndyCar racing or BMW was going to hire me on a three-year deal. The IndyCar thing was a two-year deal with, I think, Kogan, Kogan or something like that back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I picked the BMW thing and, you know, I mean, maybe there would have been more money and who knows what. You always wonder about the who knows, right, with the IndyCar <laughs> stuff. But uh, I really enjoyed sports car racing at the time and I thought it would be a, a good pairing. So, you know, still, still yeah, 53 I think years old, that, still doing yeah. it. I can't. <laughs> that's uh, that's certainly proven out i was the uh the announcer for the atlantic series that year and uh that was a lot of fun to have you out there uh, running and gunning you've also driven aside from bmws you you have driven some pretty spectacular stuff and you wheeled one of my all-time favorite cars at one point uh it's uh the beautiful ferrari 333 sp um one of the greatest sounding cars ever and uh just an absolute joy what was it like to drive uh, that was that was a, a piece of art that you were driving. It was so nice that twelve cylinder screaming motor in the back. So that that not that particular program, but the program that led to that was uh, a step down in your your humbling experience. It, it grounds you when you start to think your head's getting a little too big. That was my opportunity to go to Momo and race for Jean Pierre Moretti in uh, Daytona. Right. So that year. We did a lot of testing with the 333 in the background because that 12-cylinder motor had a, a little issue where it wouldn't start after a while. I don't know if you remember that. They were in pit lane. They lost compression. They wouldn't start. So we did a big 24-hour test. I was with a guy named Tim Hubman who was the financier behind the program. And I thought he was like, we're going to do 333s with John Piero Moretti. We're going to do IndyCar. We'll start with Atlanta. Like this whole thing was going. And I thought, oh, my gosh, it's all happening. And the Momo deal, I basically qualified that car on the pole in Daytona. And uh, Kevin Doran, who was running the, the Momo team, said, hey, um, Tim Hubbin, this, where's this guy? He hasn't shown up. And it was John, Mor John Morton and myself, Tim, Tim Hubbin, racing this car. And uh, he hasn't shown up to give the final paycheck, the check to the team. And I'm like, uh-oh, that's not good. And he goes, we're not going to run this car if, it, uh, if the check doesn't come. So I qualify the car on the pole. Gentlemen, start your engines. Check never comes. Uh, cover essentially goes over it, goes away. And that was the 4-8 to Tim Pappas, who took over the other car and won that whole race. And that launched his career into, uh, into the, what, what happened with him. And that guy became really good, drove Indy cars, everything else. Yeah. But it's a grounding experience. You can never get too big for your britches. Always remember where you came from and uh, be very thankful. That's been my, my, kind of my whole mantra the whole way. And, yeah, you can tell. Um, you absolutely love it. Uh, you know, I mean, in a way... It, you know, you're, you've been very lucky in that you've really, you're a big kid that's just been able to, to make a career out of, out of things you absolutely love. And it's been, you know, very special. And, you know, talking about beautiful V12s sitting behind you, um, when you got the opportunity to drive the, 
V12 LMR um, as a, a full race program. Uh, what an amazing beast that is. We actually have a little bit of video of you doing some testing in that car at Mid-Ohio. Um, this thing was just spectacular, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, well let's listen to it here. You can hear this thing. Oh yeah, that, that car, um, the way that program came to be was I had heard little inklings that it was going to happen. Didn't really know much about it. I went to Austria to Kitzbühel for the BMW banquet and um, we were going to go there. That's where you renew your contracts and you do training and you do all the stuff and then they have the banquet. It's really exciting and fun. And um, I'm sitting, I have no idea what was going on. I'm sitting at, at the banquet at my table eating dinner and then the big screen goes dark, you know, where they have the videos on the movie screen and all of a sudden you see these two ominous headlights light up on the screen and you hear this sound and this motor starts up and it's real, it's it's uh, surreal to watch this on the screen. I'm like, what are they gonna show? And then, and then a curtain opens in the back of the building and this V12 LMR drives in with um, Christensen driving the thing. And I'm like, whoa, look at this car. This is the most amazing car I've ever seen in my life, right? So I'm just looking at it in awe, like a complete spectator at this banquet. And then they talk about that it's gonna run in America, uh, a two car team, and they make an announcement of the drivers and my name gets called and I am positive this is a mistake because nobody even talked to me about it and my name gets said and uh, I was freaking out that, that I'm gonna drive this thing. And all I could think about was get out of this building before somebody tells you it's a joke or a mistake. Get out of here and go back to America. And uh, it actually happened. I drove that for the both years that it was in America. Uh, one year with uh, Smokin' Joe Winkelhock, who was a DTM driver from Germany, BMW guy. And the next year with uh, Jean-Marc Gounon, who was like a F1 driver, French guy, crazy guy. Maybe Belgium, I don't know, I actually can't remember. But these were, and then the other guys were Jorg Muller and uh, Steve Soper and JJ Leto in the other car. And man, that car was amazing. And, and it was so cutting edge that when they first unveiled it, we were so fast compared like, let's say the 333s that we raced against or the Lola Judds yeah. or this type of thing. And then Audi oh, yeah. had to come and bring the R8 out, and that's who we kind of raced against. And, and then it became some real hard work. It was fun. Well, one of the great things I've experienced over the years with opportunities to interview Bill Oberlin is he is a talker. He is a great interview, and he is one of the most energetic and enthusiastic storytellers. And now you know that for real. What a great, great story his is. And with that, we're going to wrap things up here in Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP. But as always, before we do, please take a moment to go and check out raceforrp.org and relapsingpolychondritis.org, the two websites of note as we continue to do everything we possibly can to help find a treatment and a cure for this terrible disease. Big thanks to all of our guests, and we'll see you next time on Full Throttle, powered by Race for RP.